Welcome to episode 92. <laughs> oh my God, that's going on the YouTube video. Funko Mary is like, <laughs> that's disturbing. It's the res again. <laughs> Ew. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah, hi to our YouTube users that, that just, uh, or users or viewers who just saw that. Um, anyway, uh, welcome to episode 92 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. Tonight, I am joined by the guy that has put up with me for 91 episodes in separate locations. But tonight for episode 92, this is our first episode where we are recording in the same location in separate rooms, though. Um, but he's a real trooper for that. Um, and he's also the most awesome Civil War nerd I know, Darren Weeks. And I'm oh, his co-host, Mayor. Very creative. Well, by your background, it seems like we'd be recording this on, on Little Round Top or on Culp's Hill at Gettysburg. Wow, you we're not allowed to be <laughs> at, we're, not, we're, not, we're not allowed to be at dark, so that can't be the case. So anyway, so how what's going on with you? How are it's good to be back? We are it back is. after a month hiatus. Thank God those jurors saw it your way because we're back. And now right. we get to do a whole new episode. Very cool. So how, how are things? Exactly. They're good. They're good. Um, yeah, I'm settling into life here in the United States as a student again, doing my master's in library science. And uh, obviously we're in the same place now. So, and you haven't booted my ass out yet. So that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. No, no. So it's definitely <laughs> good. So it's definitely good. Well, since you're hosting, I will ask you what you're drinking since you probably forgot how we do this. It's been so long. So oh my I'll God. You, what are you drinking? Um, I am drinking um, Forever New England by Cisco Brewers out of Nantucket because uh, it's New England Patriots beer and they play their first game this Sunday for the season. What are you drinking? Well, I'm drinking Cisco Brewers Whale Tail. Um, apparently you're not drinking out of a mug or anything that you didn't talk oh, about. Oh, wait, so. no, I'm sorry. No, I'm drinking it out of oh, wow, like rusty, rusty. The viewers can't see this, but it is a Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain 20th main glass. Um, and because it's his birthday today. So that is actually one thing we're going to be talking about to start off is it's Joshua Lawrence's Chamberlain's birthday. Okay. Okay. And since you didn't ask, I will tell you. I'm drinking out of my British mug because my people lost our queen today. Very sad about that. But your people, the, the, my, my people, my British people, my heritage, my 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 peeps, my peeps back in the homeland. So well, we're all getting through it best way we can. Yeah, that's how well, it is. Well, I do think we kind of need to say something about Queen Elizabeth because we are recording on, unfortunately, the day that she passed away. Um, I'm Canadian. She's head of state for my country, and. I mean, I think the world lost a very special lady today. Nope, absolutely. I mean, she's been around for a long, long time. 70 plus years as queen. So, uh, Oh, big time. Yeah, big time. That, you know, and just and like the old TV show from the 80s, it's time. And now it's Charles in charge, Mary. That's what's time oh for God. that. So it's back. Every, so Charles is back. So. Charles, Charles, King Charles III, I think it is. But the other thing I was going to say is, like, she is a, a lady who witnessed so many different historical events in her lifetime. I think it was, what did you tell me? Like 13 presidents and like, I mean, how many Canadian prime ministers, world leaders she's met, historical events, like you think yet, World War II, somehow, Vietnam. Somehow yeah. she never saw the Indians win a World Series as queen, which is hilarious. You fucker. <laughs> anyway, it's sad, you know, she, you know, she died yeah. in Scotland today. And you know, life is circular, Mary, as they say, you know, full circle. Today, we're going to talk about a guy who was born in Scotland. We are. Okay. We are. So it's interesting we're going to talk about that. This guy we're going to talk about, I don't know if you know this, Mary, but he commanded a flank at Gettysburg. Okay. He he refused his line. He fought against overwhelming odds. And he, he led a bayonet charge to help save the Union bacon. And we're not talking about the you're guy with saying. the mustache from Bowdoin. We're we'll talking about I was going to say, else. you're not talking about the birthday bay or birthday we're not boy? birthday boy okay we're talking about of course david ireland we're going to talk a lot about him now david ireland someone who you know um you know, he was that guy who you know despite all the heroics we're going to talk about you're not going to find a david ireland t-shirt on steinware avenue god i've god knows i've looked you're not going to find one okay and we think it's you know primarily he doesn't get a lot of publicity because he you know in the historical mainstream anyway you know because he wasn't in the movie Gettysburg or Michael Shara's book, Killer Angels. David Ireland's story is fascinating, and it's one that really needs to have a really bright light shined on it. You know, um, 
he's somebody who just falls, falls between the cracks. And we're going to talk about it. And it's not just Gettysburg. He's, his story is a very fascinating one before Gettysburg and post Gettysburg. So I think, I think it's time we give him his due. I think it's something that a lot of people talk about. They see the monument up there at Culp Hill, but I think he's somebody who we need to take, as you like to say, Mary, a deep dive into this gentleman, David Ireland. I would agree. Yeah, he's a guy who, I mean, as you said, there's so much more to him than just Gettysburg. Um, he goes into the Western theater, but to me, his story is just as fascinating as Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's. You know, like you said, there's so many similarities between the two. And um, one of the the books I used for my research for this was Trudeau's Gettysburg. I was just reading in it to see what he had to say about David Ireland. And he he does compare him to Chamberlain. He says, like Chamberlain, he he faces, you know, the, the odds are kind of against him um, numerically. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got to think on the fly really, really quickly. But this is a guy that, you know, Ireland doesn't just do this at Gettysburg he has to do it elsewhere during the civil war too. And his whole life is quite fascinating what he does. And, and he's the guy that he's obviously the next general we've chosen to talk about on the podcast. And he's our, yeah. he's the guy that's bringing us out of our hiatus, I guess you could say. He you is. Know? Like, he is. You know, like many participants in the, in the Union Army, David Ireland, you know, he wasn't born in the United States. Like we mentioned a few minutes ago, he was born in Scotland of all places, Mary. His last name is Ireland. We had some fun. You were trying to Google him and thought he yeah. was the Irish Brigade. Is he the Irish Brigade? Yeah, I fully But really he was born that. in a place called Forfar. He was born on May 9th, 1832. He was the son of Charles Ireland and Barbara Nave. Okay. Now, what's interesting about Charles, he was a tailor and he moved to New York City. Uh, in 1840, when David was eight years old. Now, since his father was a tailor, he bestowed the values on, on David to dress very, very well. And that was a big thing with him throughout his entire life. He always dressed well, work hard, dress well doing it. And this stayed with him right up until his death. Um, and so for the most part, and, and the thing about it, though, is something they obviously didn't teach you with the DQ and your dress policy about dressing well, because I've seen the hats and it's not impressive, you know? What? But the thing about it is Dave Ireland, you know, he, he was going to be a tailor. He was a tailor's apprentice under his father. And when the Civil War broke out in eight, April 16, uh, 1861, you know, Ireland, like many men in the North, you know, he felt the need to enlist. So in the summer of 1861, Dave Ireland finds himself as a lieutenant, okay, in the 79th New York. It's a regiment consisting of U.S. regulars, okay? Mm -hmm. And with, with it. While he's, and this is going to be important to talk about as he goes further on in his command with, with his later regiment we're going to talk about, while, this, while with the 79th, he's going to have that benefit of receiving training, okay, as a U.S. regular soldier. Mm -hmm. So he's going to get the training, the discipline, the whole deal, and it's going to benefit himself, and it's going to benefit his, his soldiers down the road. Yeah, it is. So as you said, he becomes part of the 79th uh New York. They start off as a militia, but then they um, get kind of, you know, brought into the regular army. And they're they're going to they're mustered into federal service on May 29th, 1861. So that's when they kind of they they get brought into the Civil War. And the first battle they're going to fight in is obviously First Bull Run, July 21st, 1861. Ireland is a lieutenant by this point. He's also an adjutant. The 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 79th is led by Colonel James Cameron. No word if he's well, must have, must have, must have before, before Titanic. Titanic. Uh, yeah, I don't know if he's going to be directing Titanic after this one. But they're going to fight with General Sherman, who is then a colonel at this time. So it's Colonel Sherman with his 3rd Brigade at the first Battle of Bull Run. Now, during the battle, Cameron is going to be killed. And many of the officers, they just resign after this, a number of men just mutinied and they were basically like, screw this. We don't want to do this. And because of this, McClellan takes their colors away. So he takes away their flag. That's a huge thing. If that happens to you, um, you know, when you're fighting, like, and you get your colors taken away because the colors are everything we talked about in that, in our, our last episode about the 54th Massachusetts, where you know, there was like, who's going to let, like, we can't let the colors fall, right? If you get them taken away, that that's a really big thing. So Ireland, though, takes over command of the 79th after this as well, but they don't have their colors. So flash forward to September 11th, 1861, with the ambush at Lewinsville, which is near Falls Church, Virginia. 
And Ireland is going to lead an ambush at this. And what it is, is it's a very small battle and Confederates and Union, they both lay claim to the victory, to a victory here. No, there's no Confederate casualties. There's three Union troops killed and four are taken prisoners. This is also the battle where Jeb Stewart is promoted to general. So Jeb Stewart fans, there you go. Um, there's a force of 1800 troops led by Union General William Baldy Smith, and they are just going on a reconnaissance mission. Um, and Union Colonel Isaac Stevens is here. And one of the men he's leading is Colonel David Ireland. And like I said, it's recon mission and all that. Both sides claim victory. The recon mission happens and they start to go away. Jeb Stewart attacks them and the Union has to flee. Well, it's Ireland who is going to kind of bring up the rear guard of this and protect the army. And because of this, McClellan restores the colors to the 79th New York. So there's that. But also Ireland gets promoted to captain and he's going to be promoted to the 15th U.S. Infantry. And this is what leads us into him going to the Newport Barracks. Right. So he's going to get in the fall of 1861. Like you said, he's going to get promoted to captain. And he's going to get the responsibility of recruiting troops in upstate New York for William T. Sherman. OK, mm -hmm. his army in Ohio. Now. He he's a natural recruiter. He's he's a sharp looking guy, good looking guy. Like we said before, he's dressed to the nines, always looking good. He actually and looks like he has this perpetual look of like he doesn't take any bullshit from anybody. Like, I don't know what it is about him, but he just looks like this guy that's like down to business all the time. He probably works at the mine, Gettysburg. It's probably where he works part after the, after the war. Though. Or the DQ, actually. Well, DQ anyway. But so, but his father must have been proud of him because he looked sharp. He dressed the part. And um, in early of 1862, uh, 18, uh, he, Ireland's going to arrive in, in Binghamton, New York, okay? It's a town of about 25,000 people in 1862. It sits right over the Pennsylvania border, right on that Susquehanna River, uh, right there where it connects the Chenango River. And around this time, He's going to be, he always seems to meet people in his life that are influential. Had Sherman originally, he's going to meet a guy now named Sher, uh, Sherman Phelps. Another Sherman, okay, different, different name. Phelps is a member of the elite Phelps family, okay? This is a family that it, still to this day has a strong elite impact in Binghamton, New York to this day, okay? Phelps Mansion was built in 1870, 71, uh, later on after the war, but they're still a very influential family, okay? And this relationship is going to tie Ireland to the Phelps family with the rest of his life, okay? Phelps was a judge. He was a successful businessman. You know, he was a banker. Um, but he was also an influential committee member of the 24th Regional Military District, which is, let's guess where? Binghamton, okay? Mm -hmm. Phelps took a shine to Ireland, okay? Probably because, he, like I say, he looked the part, the whole deal, Sherman's guys. And he had just turned 30 at this point. This is, this is Ireland now we're talking about. And when Ireland was in Binghamton recruiting, by happenstance, okay, Phelps' niece Sarah was in town along with his nephew, a kid named Norman, okay? Sarah Phelps was just 18 years old. Uh, she was the daughter of a doctor who had ties to a local, the local real estate, uh, uh, railroad industry and other New York elites in that area. So she was a very connected, connected uh, girl there, okay? Soon upon the, her arrival, Sarah Phelps and David Ireland met and soon became a hot and heavy. Okay, that's kind of <laughs> what happened, all right? Now, yeah. the young, the young dashing officer in his pristine blue uniform, he's gonna he made Sarah, you know, swoon harder than you did at the, the Olive Road as Howard statue. That's Ooh. how that's how impressive she was. It was you know, that whole thing. But but you know, but Ireland, you know, he had a job to do in town, which of course is to recruit and recruit he did. Now the locals flocked to him like a moth to the flame, okay. And by August 1862, he had raised a regiment that would be known as the 137th New York. Of course, he'll be chosen as the man to command it, okay? And he will be given the title of colonel. The iron, the 137th, they're going to get the nickname the Ironclads. That's what they're going to be called, okay? That's interesting. They pulled three companies from Tioga County, four from Broome County, and three more from Tompkins County, all in that area. These are firemen shopkeepers, uh, farmers, the, the traditional union type assignees, okay? That's mm -hmm. who they were. Um, it was written in a local newspaper that the regiment contained a noble body of men of splendid physical appearance, most of whom had been reared in the rural districts. 
That's what it said in the local newspaper, okay? The ages of the recruits were a wide range. They ranged from as young as 14 to as old as 50, okay? Wow. The, the youngest recruit is a 14-year-old kid named Ambrose Davidson, okay? He wanted to sign up, but he was too young. So to enlist, he needed to lie, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. So you know how he enlisted? He took a piece of paper with one eight on it, put it in his shoe. He walks up to the enlistment station. The guy says, are you over 18? He says, yes, I am. And he's oh my stick God. on top of his paper. One eight. So that's how he got away with it. So he enlisted. Unfortunately for him, he's going to die in 1863 in a hospital Washington. He didn't oh my make God. It. But that's how he, that's how he got away with lying. He wrote one eight and said, I'm above one eight. Yeah, I'm on. You know, that's how it was. So the oldest recruit, a 50 year old guy, his name was Henry Shipman. He lived at the site of today's Phelps mansion. Okay. Which was built, like I said, in early 1870s, mm -hmm. give or take. And he was going to be the company of captain F. Now it sounds like this guy was an older 50 versus a younger 50. His body was probably whatever. Okay. So according to troops, you know, when, when Shipman got tired of marching, and they did a lot of marching, Ireland would, would stop and let him ride his horse while he walked with the troops and carried all his baggage. So this 50-year-old guy could, could make it. Wow. And these type of things, even though Ireland was a strict disciplinarian, a U.S. regular, it really made him a beloved guy amongst the troops, which is going to be important later, okay? Well, there was now, one what, quote I found where um, I think it was the governor of New York who said, or no, it was one of his soldiers who said, we knew him to be a kindly and gentlemanly officer and brave soldier. And I think that just, that really illustrates what you just said about him help having this guy, like letting him ride on his horse, right? That. He was a guy who trained them really hard. I have mm -hmm. to think they didn't like him at the beginning because of how the training was. But this is a guy, and it's important, Ireland trained them as if they were U.S. regulars. He gave mm -hmm. them the same training he got. Now, a lot of these guys in these other regiments didn't get that benefit. They were trained by volunteers. Yeah. We, you know, we talked a lot about Rufus Dawes and the 6th Wisconsin. And well, the I was going to say, though, had, but like right? when Gibbon came into take over the like what became the iron brigade i think given trained those guys like regulars didn't he and that's why they became as good as they were but i think they also came to respect him because of that so i mean could we say like ireland and given are kind of alike in that way and how they train their troops no i think so i think so but the men really appreciate it they didn't maybe didn't like it mm -hmm. at the beginning it's like tough love but they they would yeah. appreciate it later on so the 137th, they trained really hard at a place called Camp Susquehanna, okay, starting on August 31st, 1862. And they were officially mustered in as a regiment of 137th on September 25th, okay? This is just a week after the Battle of Antietam. So if things are getting really bloody, things are getting really bad. Yep. Two days later, the 137th is going to be led by Ireland, and they're going to leave the nest of Binghamton, okay, for war. Now, the local paper described their departure, and, and uh, there was a lot of rah-rah and a lot of that, but it was a lot of fear and a lot of, of negative vibes. The paper said, deep-seated below the cheers and applause, which were given to these brave soldier volunteers as they marched through the streets, there was a most profound anguish, for there had never been such a sad scene at the homes of these enlisted boys and men when the hour came to which they had to say their goodbyes, okay? So these guys were trained, they were fired up to go, but they would have, at this point, it, it got real, really, really quick. Now, you know, just to tell about the organization, these guys, the organization, they're going to, the 137th is placed in the 12th Corps in the Army of the Potomac under the newly hired Henry Slocum, okay? He's mm -hmm. the Corps commander who had just taken over for Joseph Mansfield, who got killed at Antietam like a week before, Okay. So now you're going to do command uh, as far as the um, as far as core command. Um, Ireland's direct boss was a brigade commander, a 61 year old Rhode Islander named George Sears Green, and we'll Paps talk about Green. him. Paps Green, okay. And he, they'll report to their division commander, and a fellow Scot of all things, John Geary from Pennsylvania. So here mm -hmm. we go with Scotland again. Now, 137th is going to have to wait to see their first action, though, because they were listed as a reserve in the Battle of Fredericksburg. They didn't see any action at Fredericksburg, probably for the best, okay? And they had to settle into the winter. They had to witness Ambrose Burnside and his, his mud march fiasco. They're on the mud march, aren't they? 
And so they had to deal with all that. This yeah. was kind of their baptism. Ireland's men are going to finally see the, the elephant, as they say, on May 2nd, 1863, near Fairview at the Battle of Chancellorsville, okay? Mm -hmm. um, not far from the 11th Corps, my old, what's his name? Uh, he was right on the corner. Howard. From yeah, oh, that's right. I forgot who that was. But this was Ireland's first personal experience leading troops in a battle as, as a, you know, as a commander of a regiment. Mm -hmm. And they're near and Catherine Furnace, right? And they're, they're just... They're, they're, they're just southeast of Catherine Furnace, if you know the area, by Fairview, okay? They're not going to see any infantry combat, but they are going to be shelled relentlessly in their position, okay? And they suffered 55 casualties, including their first regimental death, the first death of anybody in the 137th, a 16-year-old boy, a private. Ireland, uh, Ireland he's going to write afterwards of this, of the unit, that they manifested much coolness and bravery. So picture them. They still haven't seen, have seen fire yet, but they're sitting there as artillery is raining down on them and they can't move. They're stuck there. And that's kind of their baptism. So despite the butt kicking that, that, that the entire Union Army took at that battle, Ireland is going to proudly say that that regiment did not lose one color. Going back to your color story from mm -hmm. okay, again, they did not lose one. They were the last regiment in the entire Union Army to cross the Rapidan after the battle. Yeah. So what he's trying to say is, look, we didn't, we weren't in it, but we showed a lot of bravery, right? And, and, and the men, they got this va that valuable experience of being under fire, because it's really at Gettysburg we're going to talk about where the 137th really takes off. And like I said earlier, due to the exclusion from books and movies, most people don't really know their story at Gettysburg. But when we talk about Gettysburg here, you know, what they did at Gettysburg is one of the most important must-haves of the Union Army. It, and, it, 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 and it's one of those things where um, it not only needs to be heard, but it needs to be learned, okay? Yeah, it's and I think— greatest, one of the greatest military moments in American history. I, I completely agree. And, and I have to say, to, to really understand what Ireland and his men— they are the right flank of the Union Army um, at Gettysburg. You have to go to Culp's Hill. You absolutely need to. So, I mean, if you're going to Gettysburg, I mean, go to Culp's Hill. It is, I mean, and really you can't go to Round Top, but even if Round Top are open, go to Culp's Hill because it's going to help you to understand exactly what Ireland and his men do here in the 137th New York because it is like, You'll go there and you'll be like, what the hell? Like, that's how I am. Every time I go there, I'm like, how did they do this? And I mean, thankfully, Darren, that that's because of you, because you you do tell the story so well of Ireland and his men and what they do here. Well, I mean, without going to the whole the whole story of the, the history of the battle of Gettysburg really after that, yeah. you know, by the battle, you know, by the battle second day, you know, the Union Army, you know, they're gonna hold the high ground on Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. Um, it's a pair of elevations south of the town. That was the key part of the battlefield for both armies. The 12th Corps had six total brigades, okay? They were positioned on Culp's Hill. A hill has two peaks, okay? Upper Culp's Hill is about 600 feet above sea level, and it's connected to a smaller hill, lower Culp's Hill. And in between the two, there's like a saddle or a little patch of, of slow undulating ground, okay? Between the two, that kind of connects. Rolling hills. Okay? Exactly. The land is going to be owned by a local named Henry Culp, okay? It's a heavily wooded area with boulders thrown all over the place. Um, and the underbrush is going to be kind of thinned out because of the animals. Just picture like a picnic ground. That's how it looks. But it's steep and it's wooded. And the way it looks right now, if you go to Gettysburg, is pretty much the way it looked at the battle. Maybe it's grown a little bit more lately, but when they did the whole other work, it was very, very accurate. You know, by July 2nd, okay, this is the second day of the battle now. The Union knew holding Culp's Hill was crucial. Now, it was the high ground uh, behind the Union line that stood over Baltimore Pike. Baltimore Pike is a straight shot to Washington, D.C. It turns into Georgia Avenue, okay? And it's one of two supply roads that George Meade's going to have for the Army of the Potomac. The other, of course, is Tawny Town, which leads to Westminster. So they have to hold these roads, but especially Baltimore Pike is mm -hmm. behind the Union line. So around 4 p.m. On the, in the afternoon on July 2nd, James Longstreet's Confederate Corps is going to do their thing on the, on the, on the other side, on the, on the, uh, the Union left. 
this is going to result in the battles of the Round Top, the Wheat Field, the Peach Orchard, all that stuff that people know Gettysburg, okay? Um, the sightings of the Rosewoods Clown was probably seen for the first time somewhere <laughs> around here. But, but fearing the battle could be lost on that side of the battlefield. I mentioned those six brigades on Culp's Hill, five yeah. of them are going to get redeployed from the 12th Corps to that part of the battlefield to defend the Union position. Now, that's going to leave just one brigade led by George Sears Green to hold that hill. And it was that urgent hold for the Union. Okay, so just imagine the situation now. It's getting late in the afternoon. What you had at one point, you know, six brigades, 22 regiments you had. Now you strip to one, to, you know, to basically one brigade and five regiments, okay? You're going to be left with just New Yorkers, 160th, the 102nd, the 78th, the 149th, and the 137th, okay? Um, but, and because they were stripped of manpower, instead of that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder double rank that you used to seeing, you're talking about a full social distancing situation. I was okay? just going to say, you put it so well in our live that we did on Sunday, like saying like they're basically social distancing from each other in this and not because they have to, but because they have no choice because they've lost, you know, so many men to, to go elsewhere on the battlefield. Right. And, and so, so they have no choice, yeah. but to spread themselves out like that. They're basically at arm's length from each other. Okay. Now green, the thing about green, okay. Besides being a Rhode Islander, so you know, he knows what he's talking about, Mary. He's probably a Patriot fan too. Go Pats, <laughs> by the way, opening weekend. Right. You just he got a high a, five there from our Rhode okay. Island listeners. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. But he was a trained engineer. So he knew the land, he knew the importance of terrain. So especially fighting defensively, which he knew he was going to have to do. So despite the protests of his division, Commander John Geary, who told him, no, he's going to go ahead and build breastworks to protect his brigade. Geary felt that fighting with breastworks gave soldiers a, a um, an un unnecessary feeling of a if you fought without them, you weren't as good, or some, some silly phrase he said. Oh my God. But, Gear, but, but Green felt that the saving of a life meant more than some silly philosophy. So he did them, and thank God they did, okay? He also repositioned his men along the slope, okay? He's going to have the 60th, followed by the 102nd, the 78th, the 149th, and then Ireland is going to be on the flank. He put Ireland on the flank because they were better trained. These, these U.S. regular trained type guys, okay? So he's on the right flank of the entire Union Army, okay? Now, we'll never know if Green gave a sappy speech like Strong Vincent in the movie. You're the just gonna You cannot, sir. You must be stubborn. You I was just going to say, like, is this one like, we are the flank? Uh, you can take it by the rear. You know, like he was. <laughs> I mean, if he does, if he does that. But one thing, but one thing he did do is he did tell him that your your flank, your right flank is in the air. It's not it's not positioned up against anything. Okay. Yeah. So he's going to tell Ireland and his men to dig a traverse or a trench, and the soldiers of the one thirty seven did not like this. It was hot. They were sick of building breastworks. Now they got to do another one. So they grumbled. But they had to build a traverse that basically set off to a right angle. And thank God they did. It's going to prove to save their lives later on. So by 5 o'clock now, Confederate General Allegheny Johnson, okay, in a second, he's in the second division under Richard Yule's second corps. Guess what's going to happen, Mary? He's going to notice that suddenly all those soldiers up on the hill aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. So he sees an opportunity here, okay, <laughs> that maybe – you know, just maybe he has a chance to do something with that hill. So what seemed like that Gibraltar of what it seemed before now looks very vulnerable. And if the Rebs are going to attack right up the hill and they get up there, this could be a game changer, okay? So they're going to start that attack, all right? They're going to go up the hill and they're going to hit right in the middle of the line. They're going to hit the 149th, which is just on the left of Ireland's 137. So it's going to lead to a bunch of fire. Before you know it, okay, Ireland, he's got 423 men. That's all he has, okay? Mm -hmm. In his front, he has six Confederate regiments coming at him under a guy named George Stewart, also known as Marilyn Stewart, okay? Yep. Guess where he was from? Virginia. With that nickname. No, he was from Maryland. Oh, right. Probably just... a, probably, but probably he commanded the 10th staff. Virginia, didn't he? No, he was, a, he was in charge of the brigade. He was, he was the brigade commander for oh, okay. that. So, um, his six regiments was the 1st and 3rd North Carolina, the 10th, 23rd, 
37th Virginia and the 1st Maryland Battalion, okay? They have 2,121 men, okay? Quick math, Formula Mary. 2,121 versus 423. What, what kind of ratio is that? That's uh, not a good ratio. Even I can say that as somebody okay. who sucks at It's math. almost exactly five to one, okay? Oh. George Stewart has a five to one man advantage, okay, against Ireland's 137. This is what it's going to come down to, okay? Ireland knew, because he was at the end of the line, that he could not retreat at any cost. He had to stay. So again, with darkness falling, okay, and all these brigades coming at him face to face, besides that, everything seemed to be okay. Yeah, but, that's but he's how- in, the, but earlier in the day, he, so earlier in the day, we have Chamberlain doing what he does at Round Top. Ireland is now pretty much in the same position to what Chamberlain was, except he's in the dark, right? We're going to talk about Chamberlain here in a minute. We're going to yeah. talk about that. But yeah, that's just interesting parallel, okay? You know, he must have he must have knew that he was in a bad spot. He's going to get word now. Now, this is, again, this is where you start to draw the parallels with the other side going on. He's going to find out that four of, of Maryland Stewart's regiments, this is the 1st Car- North Carolina and 37th, the 10th, and the 23rd VA, Virginia, they're trying to get around and turn his flank now, mm-hmm. okay? And they position, and they've just, they've, these Confederates have positioned themselves behind a stone wall right on Lower Culp's Hill now. So on the far end of, of Ireland's line is Company A. And to their left is Company F, okay? Now, both companies started to take heavy fire on their extreme right flank now. So they're, they're kind of screwed. Ireland sees this, and he's going to order Company A to refuse the line, which means you break off and you turn at a right angle, okay? to face the oncoming enemy. This is going to slow them down a little bit initially, but what's going to ultimately end up happening, as you can imagine, it's just going to force the Confederates to swing further, okay? Mm-hmm. So now at one point, the 10th Virginia, under a guy named Edward Warren, is pretty much directly behind Ireland's line. It's right up the Savannah, okay? So now this will be when Ireland's pucker effect moment is going to take over, Okay. It's because he knows he's seriously in a tough situation. He's got ribs on the fronts. He's got his flank threatened. Now his rear is threatened. And then he's also in the dark, okay? So around this time, a guy named Colonel Richard Smith of the 71st Pennsylvania comes bopping by. They're going to be coming north from Spangler Spring, okay? And this is going to be right in the middle of when this firefight's going on. Now, Ireland's doing whatever he can to plug the gaps. You can only imagine. It's dark. Their guys are all covered in yeah. crap. And it's, it's just, you can only imagine the flash, the muzzles. Smith of the 71st Pennsylvania is going to see the trouble Ireland is in. And he, he had the opportunity, I guess, to, to help out. But guess what he does, okay? After a brief fight, he gets involved for a second. He's going to lose 14 guys. And you know what he does? He says, screw this, and he leaves. Yeah. And he, he leaves Ireland holding his diaper in the rain, literally and figuratively, okay? After the battle, okay, Smith's going to say um, he didn't stay to help because he didn't want to see his men murdered. That's what he said. So he left He left Ireland's guys on, oh my God. on just left of him, said the hell with this, right? Now, Ireland is going to be basically on his own at this point, right? And he's going to have, at this point, He's going to have his men wheel to the right again. And mm-hmm. this time, they're going to set up behind that traverse they dug. Okay, mm-hmm. so now they have they these this traverse they had to reluctantly build earlier in the day. Now they got a little bit of protection now, thanks to that traverse that they really didn't want to build. Now this is very much like you were saying before, like Chamberlain it in is. the twentieth made a little round top. Okay, Ireland refused his line um, that was being out when he was being outflanked by the Rebs. The difference, of course, is this. Un, un, is unlike Chamberlain, who held out against two regiments, the 15th and 47th Alabama, he did this against an entire brigade, okay, of 2,121 guys. That's how long he did, okay? Yeah. Uh, that's how many guys he went against. Now, behind the brigade, behind the barricade, rather, and with darkness falling, this 137th New York was able to kind of hold Stewart's brigade back and this is where darkness helped them out a little bit. They held out for a full hour behind this traverse, fighting these guys in, in the dark, not knowing what the hell was going on. 
you had situations where Stewart's men were firing over the union line and hitting their own guys on the other side. It was a yeah. complete, complete cluster. Okay. I was reading about that, how that was happening. I was like, holy, but, but, <laughs> like, you know, what but, the but, hell? But, like, but, but wait, there's more. Okay. Whoa. So guess, so as the battle starts to slacken, okay. Maryland's guys start to fall back. The, the, the shots start to slow down a little yep. bit. Guess what happens is, is Joseph Gregg of company I, okay. He's going to be ordered to do a bayonet charge. Yeah. And he's going to run right. They're going to run right at the 10th Virginia. He's so badass for doing that. He's just like, fuck this. We're going to go do this. It must, it must have been the last thing. Okay. The last thing those Virginians expected was these guys running right at him. Now, sadly, Greg is going to be mortally wounded in his charge. Okay. But what it's going to do, it's going to drive Virginians back down the hill, back down Lawrence Culp Hill. And what it's going to do, it's going to pretty much stabilize Culp's Hill now. And it's going to keep the Union Army thanks to Ireland, that 137, for maintaining Culp's Hill yeah. throughout that battle. So as, as it goes on, you know, the night goes on, those five brigades I mentioned who left the dance floor to go fight against Longstreet's guys, they're going to slowly start to come back. It's going to take some time. It's dark. They're going to get lost. They're going to finally make it back. When they do get back to Culp's Hill, they're going to find a lot of Confederates in their entrenchments from where they were. It's going to lead to that next day's battle with Charles Mudge and the Second Mass. And the yep. Indians. It's all it's all going to lead to that. But now, um, what it's going to do? It's going to ultimately, thanks to Green's breastworks and the in the decision making of Ireland, they're going to be able to hold out against those odds, and they're going to be able to kind of stem that Confederate tide. Okay. Yep. Um, and the battle goes on. So July third, around four o'clock in the morning, um, the, you know the Rebs are going to kind of remove the fight back on Culp's Hill. Except now, instead of those five brigades left over from Green, they're fighting those 22 brigades again. Now, yeah. some of the guys have been lost in the middle of the battle. Uh, and the 137 is going to return to their original position, which is kind of right in the middle of the line. But at the end of the day, Ireland's regiment is going to take a beating here. Of the 423 guys I mentioned at the beginning, 40 are going to be killed, 87 wounded, 10 missing for a total of 137 ironically the same number as their regiment number yep. 137 casualties that's 32 percent going to save you the map 32 percent casualties they're going to have for this wow. okay? after the battle lieutenant collins from the 149th new york okay the one that was just to their left right next to him from syracuse okay he's going to describe in his memoirs the state of the 137th right afterwards and he's going to write the survivors of the 137th new york looked sad and mournful as they marched away, many had eyes filled with tears. Okay, these guys had had enough. They'd been through hell. They just about had it. Mm-hmm. This was their real first fight, their first and, one. And you have to look at how well they did, right? Like they're held in reserve at Fredericksburg. So they really don't get anything. I mean, now Ireland, he's he's seen the elephant, I think, at first bull run, right? Being with, with Sherman's guys that they they made it further than a lot of other union troops that day they they experienced some very hard fighting i mean all union troops did but sherman's troops were the ones that got really close to jackson right and but i think you know these guys to be at gettysburg you know they're held in reserve at fredericksburg they don't really see much at chancellorsville to experience this and do what they did but just to witness the horrors of it. Like one guy said that on July 3rd, when they were still fighting, the whole hillside seemed enveloped in a blaze. I can't imagine what these guys saw here at Culp's Hill. And I mean, if you're at, if if you're at Culp's Hill, you can understand why when Ireland and, you know, or when Greg, when he manages to drive those guys back with that bayonet charge, why they don't come back up. That hill is, it's a bitch to climb. It, it is it is it's it, there's rocks there's roots digging out from trees i mean you do it once and you're like yay i did it and then you get driven back and you're like i am not doing that again it no it is brutal but you know what though as much as you know those soldiers they lost like i said 137 casualties 137 new york right it's funny how numbers work out sometimes 32 yeah. percent. despite all that the men still were thankful for the training yeah. they got after, after the whole you know 
after this whole thing is over, Henry Shipman, that 50 year old guy we mentioned, he's back again. He's going to write afterwards the men in the regiment would not change Colonel Ireland for any officer in the entire Union Army. That's what he said, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is how much his men respected him. So, so after the Battle of Gettysburg, okay, the army could not be happier with what he, what he did, okay? So David Ireland, they're going to give a furlough to. Now, here's, how, here's what they did. They knew he had Sarah back in, back in Binghamton. And he knew mm -hmm. him. So, so what they did is they can't, they gave him a wink, wink recruiting mission back to Binghamton. <laughs> okay. It wasn't a furlough, it was a recruiting mission. So they sent him back and it was really a reward for the effort he did at Gettysburg so he can go back and see Sarah. Okay. That's what they did for him. So he does it. August 23rd, 1863. Guess what happens? Ireland and Sarah Phelps, they get themselves married. Nice. Okay. They're going to, they're going to get married. In Judge Sherman Phelps, his his uncle, her uncle's home. Okay, the ceremony was the ceremony was conducted by a local pastor named Horace Winslow. Now, this the, the, this whole guise of a recruiting trip was was known by everybody. So during the ceremony, Winslow said this of the couple. This is what he this is what he said at the wedding. He wrote, "The gallant Colonel Ireland of the 137th New York Regiment, it will be seen by our by our marriage column." He has been on a recruiting trip to this village. We congratulate him on his selection of a new aide de camp and wish him a smooth and prosperous <laughs> campaign in the battle of life. Wow. Okay. So what they're saying is he has a recruiting trip and he came and he found himself a wife. Okay. Yeah. But that's how they did it. Now, the problem with being in the army, Mary, is you can't stick around too long. So unfortunately no. for the newlyweds, their time together is going to be short on this trip. Um, I imagine those couple of days they spent all that time probably talking about battle lines and file probably closures. Sure. Probably, yeah, no, that, that's, yep. that's probably what they did the yep. whole entire time. So <laughs> now, now, while this is all going on, I don't know if you know this, Mary, but there was also a Western theater. Okay? There, oh, and, I was just about to <laughs> mention that. And so, and so the, in the Western theater, the war was raging in Tennessee. Now, the 12th Corps, which was currently camped in Virginia, is going to be shipped via train for the Western Theater to join U.S. Grant's army. And this is going to include the 137th New York. Mm -hmm. So Ireland had to say goodbye to Sarah again and return to the front. So once again, now in the West, the 137th is going to be thrown right into the fire again. They are. And I was going to say, along with, you know, just this moving out West is not just the 12th Corps and a lot of the regiments that are with them at Gettysburg, but also the 11th Corps, Joseph Hooker goes out there too. But like, you know, the one thing about this that, you know, the, the 12th Corps is kind of like, 11th, 12th Corps kind of like the Island of Misfit Toys when it comes to the Army of the Potomac. But they're going to go out West, 137th with David, David Ireland is going to go out there. And they are going to do, they're going to be part of, a few battles in the Western theater that are quite key in securing the city of Chattanooga, but also Atlanta as well. Yeah. So they're going to go West um, and they're going to be part of that siege of Chattanooga. We talked about Ireland's men are going to find themselves again at the end of the line, this time with the battle of Wahachi yeah. on August 28th and the 29th. This is that midnight to 3 a.m. shit show. Okay. Yeah. And they had to fight for three hours in that early morning because the Rebs are trying to shut down that new open cracker line that, that William Rosecrans had gone through yep. and, and settle that whole thing. Rosecrans, Mary. Okay. Good guy. Not for, not for nothing. But so what? So this is during the Chattanooga siege when Bragg is trying to basically starve them out. They, they open that supply line. Now the Rebs are going to try to shut that supply line down. And this is going to be where Ireland and his guys are going to, are going to stand up again, be put again on the end of the flank. Yep. And they're going to help secure and push the Rebs back to keep that supply line open. So they're, they're still in it again, right? A month later, at the, bat, the actual Battle of Chattanooga, okay? Yeah, in November. They're going, to, they're going to fight with Joseph Hooker at Lookout Mountain in the famous Battle Above the Clouds, right? And they're going to help it was chase It's not Braga. just pure romance. Sorry. He's gonna. They're gonna fight. You know, they're gonna fight. Um, Bragg chase him into what uh, North Carolina. I mean, uh, to, to North Georgia, and it's funny because dude, I I forget the I forget the name of the regiment that was behind them, but as they were chasing the Rebs up Lookout Mountain, the Rebs dropped their flags and ran. 
Yeah. The regiment behind them pick up the flags and all those guys with medals of honor get the flags. Yeah. And, the, and the New Yorkers were pissed at that. Oh, I can't blame them for that. Well, when we go to Lookout Mountain, we'll have to see if we can find all those monuments for them too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's no question. And, you know, but this island again, by this time, he's a brigade commander now. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be commanding those same, same New York brigades that he was going to be doing, right? Now, the following winter, the following winter now, Ireland's men are going to be in winter camp in a place called Stevenson, Alabama. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a railroad town full of bars and bang barns and all this stuff, right? <laughs> and, and, but it was also a vital railroad connection for supplies yep. for, for the troops. No, it's funny because while in Stevenson, you know, Ireland must have had the reputation of being just this, this guy, just this town, whatever. They gave him the task in his spare time while he was supposed to be relaxing in winter camp to clean up the town, be a sort of pseudo sheriff in, in Stevenson, Alabama. Oh my God. Really? Okay. So he, he was, he was in charge of getting rid of all the, the hookers, the gamblers, the transplanted Canadians, all the, all the bad seeds. <laughs> what? Okay? The transplanted Canadians? But, but, but he's, he had to clean up the town, you know, and by all accounts, he did a pretty good job of it. We're just getting rid of the riffraff in town. He apparently oh he did it, <laughs> but, but during this winter break, okay. Ireland's going to get visited by Sarah. She's mm -hmm. going to jump on the train and visit from Binghamton, take the ride down to Stevenson, and she's going to stay with Dave for Ireland for three months in mm -hmm. camp now, okay? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so this was kind of the closest thing to a honeymoon these people are going to have. So in early May, though, that honeymoon is going to come to an end because he's going to be ordered to join Sherman again. Yeah. Everything's full circle, right? To George George uh, William T Sherman on his march to take Atlanta. Yeah. And so you, so with you know with, with tears in her eyes, she's going to board the train back to New York. And sadly, this is the last time they're ever going to meet. Is, is yeah. this moment? And I guess it was it was a, it was quite an emotional thing. Um, and she, you know Ireland's going to be part of that of, of the Atlanta campaign. Mm -hmm. he's yeah. Gonna be he's... In the middle. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Oh, he's and this guy is he's gonna find himself in the middle of everything. Rasaka, Dallas, New Hope. You know, he's gonna be in Kolb's uh, Kolb's farm, Kennesaw, Mary, uh, Marietta, Peachtree you know, Peach Creek. Creek, all of it, right into Atlanta. This this he's Ireland is his guys are gonna be in the middle of all of this. Okay. When it's all said and done, the 137 New Yorkers are gonna be involved in 18 different engagements. 18. The Atlanta campaign the, has so many different engagements in it. But I mean, the whole the whole thing. I mean, he's yeah. soup to nuts here. Okay, yeah. he, you know, from he misses Fredericksburg, but from Fredericksburg to Bentonville, they're going to be involved in everything in between. Yep. Now, here's the cool thing about this, though, Mary. Okay, September second, eighteen sixty four. Okay, you know what day that is? That's the day Atlanta falls, right? That's the day Slocum okay. walks into okay. Atlanta, and he's like. But guess who though? the first guess who the first officer into Atlanta is? It's David Ireland. David Ireland. Yeah. Okay. And so you know what so he cool. does? It's like when you walk in, say you say you have a roommate with some friends, right? Yeah. You walk into an apartment, you're the first one there. What do you do? You pick out the biggest room. Mm -hmm. He walks in, he picks John Bell Hood's headquarters as his <laughs> headquarters. So that big mansion that, that Hood had, had just vacated, Ireland says, you know what? This looks good to me. I'm taking this one. And he does. That's amazing. Is, there is one of two known pickers of David Ireland that exists. One is the one you see with his hand in his pocket. Yeah. The other is him and his officers in front of the house that John Bell Hood in Atlanta stood in. That's and awesome. It, and you can see him standing there. It's only one of, one of two pickers. So that is like cool. so, I don't know. Like that's balls right there. It's like, hey, look I would at me, Hood. Look at me, Hood. Oh, I would too. You know? I would too. You know, but you know, all, all the good the, the good times kind of come to an end though, because September second he gets into he gets into Atlanta mm -hmm. and almost immediately he gets sick. Okay. Uh, and yeah. whether it's the bad food or the dirty water or who the hell knows what, he's gonna be hit with a bad case of dysentery almost immediately, like right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Um he's gonna be get quickly, he's gonna get dehydrated. Um, and eight days later on September 10th, to the shock of his men, Ireland's going to die. And they are going to be stunned by this. Stunned, right? It was the regimental chaplain, a guy named Captain Eli Roberts, who's going to personally take the body of Ireland back to Binghamton. And three days after he died, 
Okay, the Bingham the Binghamton Republic. He he was spoke he was scheduled to go back to Binghamton for a leave. Right. Okay. Yep. And he didn't make it. But the newspaper writes this in the newspaper. It is a pain. It is it is a painful due to announce the death of Colonel David Ireland. We understand his wife Sarah was expecting soon a visit from her husband. He is on the way. But alas, comes in the sad habiliments of the dead, another noble martyr to the cause of the Union. So she's literally expecting him to show up on her doorstep. Instead, she gets his coffin. Unfortunately, oh, that that and, and it's, so you can only imagine, imagine how that must have gone, right? Yeah, Ireland's uh, is going to be buried in Spring Forest Cemetery in Binghamton. He died with no money. I mean, he was a, he was a soldier. So that that judge we talked about, Sherman Phelps, yep. would have paid for his would have paid for his burial. And if you go if you go to Spring Forest Cemetery now, he has a gorgeous gravestone. Okay, and it's by it's believed that that's who paid for it was Phelps. Um, this is the same cemetery that holds the remains of John Cleveland Robinson from Gettysburg. Wow. Ironically, mm -hmm. it's also the same cemetery that holds that fourteen year old boy who lied about his eighteen year old age. Aww. Okay, Ambrose Davidson, he's buried there too. And in that, and that is going to pretty much finish the tale of David Ireland. And but the thing about it is, his legacy kind of goes on, right? They say you never really die as long as you're remembered, right? Mm -hmm. That's the old saying, okay? Yep. Sarah, his wife, his ex-wife, she's going to remarry twice. She's going to she's going to rebound, okay? And but she's always going to be known as Mrs. David Ireland to the members of 137 New York. She was a regular guest at their reunions. She would still go. Oh. In 19, she lived until 1919, okay, when, when she's going to die. She's buried in Syracuse next to her third husband, a guy named William Gear, um, who was a wealthy engineer in the area. But, um, but basically, you know, she would go to the reunions. She would see the soldiers. They'd call her Mrs. Ireland. Oh. Um, and and that's, that's the, the sad part about it, though, is, the sto you know, to this day, the story of David Ireland really isn't well known. Um, he and his wife Sarah had no children, so and there was no story to be told after that. Especially his role at Gettysburg. For the most part, he dies, and you know, and he's a hero locally, but there's no one to tell his tale. There were 63 medals of honor given at the Battle of Gettysburg. 63. You know who didn't get one? David Ireland. David Ireland. Neither did Charles Tilden. One. Right, but that, Ireland was not a recipient. Of, uh, uh, regardless of his, of his, hero, wow. his heroism, who I think a lot of people say is the true hero of the Battle of Gettysburg, especially on the flank. And mm. sadly, he's fallen from the cracks of history because really no one's been around to tell his tale. I I completely agree with you on that. Um, having visited Culp's Hill quite a few times in the last year uh, with you and just wandering down and looking up at where the union was and what he had, what, what he was doing. It's like, holy shit. He, I mean, he is the unsung hero of Gettysburg. I think with this on the right flank, with what he had to do with, I mean, how spread out his men had to be, but not only that, he reminds me a lot of John Gibbon in the sense that, um, you know, when Gibbon took over, what became the iron brigade they didn't like him at first because he was disciplining them in a way that they'd never been disciplined before but then they came to recognize it after a battle that wow this guy did good things and gibbon was at every single reunion you know with those guys even though he was not from where they were i mean gibbon was born in pennsylvania he was raised in the carolinas right um and i think in some ways in, it's it's a similar story to David Ireland's how Gib how respected David Ireland is is a lot like John Gibbon with the Iron Brigade. It's a yeah, it's very I, I similar think, to I that think, too. But I think Gibbon's legacy is one that goes. I mean, people oh, know, it is people know that Gettys, the, the, the you know, but the nobody know. But but again, yeah, that's where it differs. Is nobody knows who Ireland is, but they should because of that because of what he does. Um, he's. I mean, anybody who goes to Culp's Hill, you'll see it there. You'll oh, know so what he did. 
there's no question. But I think it's I think it's a good a good place to drop. I think it's a good story. I think it's one if you go to Gettysburg, you're going to go to Culp's Hill. Find mm-hmm. the 137 New York. Take a peek. It's tough to find the traverse. It's kind of built over a little bit, but you you can see where it is. Um, it's kind of right where the saddle is. It kind of the road kind of dips and it goes across the road. Just imagine yourself in that position. It's nighttime. You're being attacked by 2,100 guys. You're 400 guys. They're going around to your right. Now you're in, in this traverse, in this 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 ditch, this trench, uh, fighting and fighting and fighting, and you're able to hold them off. Um, and, and this is your first real infantry battle. And because of your actions, you're able to push them down the hill until those five other regiments come back. Those remaining 17 brigades are going to come back to, to bail you out. And it isn't too a reach to say that if Johnson, Allegheny Johnson, and, and those guys get up on Culp's Hill, you're behind the Union line. You have that supply road of Baltimore Pike. It's hard to imagine how that July 2nd War Council meeting is going to play out, knowing that they're yeah. right behind you. You may have to leave at that point. And yeah. if you believe that, the fact that they, that they were not up there has a lot to do with David Ireland's 137th. So nothing exactly. against the Chamberlain people, because what he did was very important too. But I think if you, because of the movie, people like Ireland don't get the credit they do. Take a peek on the other flank, because sometimes the other flank tells a better story. In this case, it's, it's in this case is true. No, I and I completely agree with that. It's a lot like uh, the Battle of Chickamauga, where if they had let them get through on that Lafayette Road to Chattanooga, things would have not went so great for the Union Army. You know, the other thing too about Ireland is, and the and the one thirty seventh is, is these are guys that fought in not only the Eastern Theater but the Western Theater, and they went to the end of the Civil War. And unfortunately, Ireland is not with them at Bentonville. But these are guys that they saw so much. They're on the march to the sea. And they go right through it to the end of the Civil War. They're not they're not there at the beginning because they don't come into it until Antietam. But they're there at the end. And they see so much. And it, it's unfortunate that Ireland was not there to witness the end of it because he was there at the beginning with the 79th New York at first bro run. No doubt. No doubt. So no, no disrespect to Chamberlain on his birthday, no, by the way, as we, as we sit here and record this, but I think it's ironic on a date when a historical person dies in Scotland, we're going to, have to throw a little bit of light on another historical person yep. born in Scotland who doesn't obviously. Care and what day does he die? He dies on September the 10th, right? 1864. Which, which is coming up the day this episode is going to yeah, drop. Yeah, the day so. this episode drops. So the day you oh, die, if you're already, listening to this already. on September the 10th, uh, this is the anniversary of David Ireland's death. It is, it is. All right, so that, that'll do it with us. So what's coming up next for us? We so know? we are going to be recording an episode with some guests, hopefully soon. Um, we are going to be doing an episode about uh, Special Order 191 and talking about that and its implications for the Maryland campaign, Battle of Antietam and all that. Uh, we are going to be having our roundtable this month in September as well. And we all have some book club news to share with you soon as well. So um, we just want to thank you all for listening to us for these last 92 episodes. And before he can say any final words from you, um, Darren, you are an amazing co-host and thank you for all your knowledge on David Ireland. Um, And also thank you for all the tours on Culp's Hill that you've given me because you have given me such an appreciation for that part of Gettysburg. Thank you. Well, you got to go to Culp's. Culp's is the way to go. So thanks everybody for listening. Everybody have a great night and hope your football team loses unless you're the Patriots this weekend. And we will look forward to talking to you all. So it's a fun stuff coming down the road. Off we go. So Mary, again, the pleasure, as we say, is always all yours. And we will talk to you all on the other side. See you guys later.